Friday night of the floor, and as I was sitting at, on the chair, Rabbi said, are you going to introduce Brooke? I go, oh, do you want me to introduce Brooke? And he goes, yeah. And because he knows I love Brooke. I adore Brooke. I respect Brooke. And the Jewish community is so fortunate to have Brooke. We have a human rights attorney who has dedicated her life, her life representing us, protecting us. Um, she spends all her time, and her husband, Matt, is a great supporter in her family. And we're, we're so fortunate because not only has she dedicated her life, her life but she has achieved remarkable results. She has been successful in fighting BDS in Europe, in Spain, in Belgium. I mean, it's, we're so fortunate to have someone being our advocate. Um, she started out as a human rights attorney, uh, was doing a documentary about um, <clears throat> uh, kids, Arabs in Israel, and feeling that they were being abused, really, they were being abused by their parents because they were, uh, they were being forced to be martyrs or terrorists. And there's a whole documentary, you should, you should look it up. Plus, she's written a book. And, but the thing that I'm just so impressed with is how she's always in the courtroom battling for our rights. And now, she's not only, she's also now representing um, victims of anti-Semitism. So, um, without further ado, because I'm going to let Brooke tell you what she's up to after she hugs Connie, rather, our Revitson Connie. Hello, Revitson. <laughs> Brooke, come on up. Purchases. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, the Lawfare Project can be a recipient, so it's really easy to do. And, uh, and so every day, when I make my Amazon purchases, part of it is going to the Lawfare Project. L A W F S N Frank A R E. Lawfare Project, we're going to talk all about it. So it's, you know, that's a really easy way to help and support. And then you can make other donations also because. We need to help support the thing project. Thank you. Thank you. But she's still working. What she has. We're all makers, man. to be here um, with Rabbi and Rabbit Kunin. I, I'm so honored to be invited back to speak, and I'm so happy that we have a new audience here. So I'm going to try not to be repetitive, but I'm going to talk about the cases that we've been involved with for the past couple of years. Helen, what, what a beautiful introduction. What an honor to be called your friend, and what a great supporter of the Lawfare Project. And I also want to mention, of course, my husband, and my in-laws, Barb and Rick Silverman, who are also major philanthropists in the Jewish community. They're here for the Stand With Us conference and major supporters of the Lawfare Project. I'm so blessed to have such wonderful in-laws. So, as, as Helen mentioned, um, I guess I'll, I'll start off a little bit about the background and, and how I got to the place where I am today, where I'm running the only Jewish civil rights litigation fund in the world. Wow. Um, it just boggles my mind, though. I don't, I don't know why there aren't more of us. Um, but it really started when I was filming my movie, The Making of a Martyr, uh, which was released in 2006 and actually won the Audience Choice Award for Best Film at the United Nations Documentary Film Festival. Um, and the movie was about the illegal indoctrination and recruitment of innocent Muslim children to become suicide homicide bombers. 
And I started making the movie when I was in my second year of law school, because at that point it occurred to me that the incitement to violence directed at Muslim children was one of the greatest crimes against humanity that is occurring today. It is a form of child abuse, it is a form of state-sponsored mass infanticide, and it was simply being ignored by the media, by so-called human rights groups. I sat on the board for about two meetings with the Human Rights Watch Children's Division at which I raised at every opportunity I could. Can we release a statement condemning the use of Muslim children as human bombs? They not only refused to do so, but they kicked me off uh, for even asking. So I, I risked my life, and over a period of two and a half years, I traveled to Janine, Ramallah, to Akam, and Nablus, and I secured firsthand interviews with leaders of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the al aqsa Samad Brigades, other designated terrorist groups in an effort to expose what I think is the root cause of theologically motivated terrorism. I was in New York after 9-11, and I remember everybody, I was during 9-11, and right after everybody you know, was asking ourselves, what did we do to create this hatred? Why do they hate us so much that they're willing to kill themselves and kill other innocents in the process? And I said, well, that's the wrong question. You know, the right question is why are they teaching their children to hate life and love death? And what are we doing about it? Because our futures are intrinsically tied to what the Muslim world is teaching their children. It is a globalized world, and that indoctrination is happening here in the United States as well. And so after I made this film, and by the way, the reason why we won the Audience Choice Award is because I got up every morning at 6 a.m. and I went to the 456 uh, train station at Astor Place and I paid the guy who was selling the New York Times $20 to stuff my flyer in. So it looked like it was being endorsed. I just think the numbers of the people that ended up just showing up at the screening, 10% voted, 9% was my family, you know, we ended up winning the award. And we got it, and the look on the face of the UN personnel, okay, giving an award to Brooke Goldstein for doing what the UN, United Nations has failed to do, which is even pass one resolution condemning the incitement to murder directed at Muslim children. It was astounding, and with that, you know, Patino, with that approval, with those laurels that everybody here loves so much up on our DVD, it ended up launching my career. And I was invited to the US State Department, to US CENTCOM. I gave 92 hours of raw, unedited footage that then became a course at US CENTCOM because we did not understand theologically motivated terrorism. And not only did we not understand it at 9-11, but we were too afraid to talk about it because of political correctness. And I was then a year and a half out of law school, and I noticed, oh, and then I got called, you know, I went I, I, on a tour to the film festivals, I was asked to be on with Dennis Prager, I got invited to CNN, I got invited to Fox News. I was 25 years old, I had zero media experience, and overnight I was on major national news media talking about Islamist terrorism just because I had become an expert because I spent two years <coughs> interviewing these people. And I had this raw footage and I wanted to explain to the world what was happening and nothing to do with politics. It's nothing to do with land. It's theological. Okay, and Golda Meir has been saying that, you know, since day one. And so as I was on television talking about these things, I noticed two things. Number one, me and all of my peers were being called Islamophobic, which I thought was totally ironic because of risking your life to expose human rights violations against Muslim children is anti-Muslim, what then is pro-Muslim? And are you the racist for saying that I am Islamophobic? In your, you know, the, the word, again, I'm pregnant, so there's <laughs> pregnancy brain, but it's um, the, the low expectations of another culture. There's a phrase for that that Brett Stevens always says that I always forget. That's the real racism. And on top of that, the one-two punch was the slander 
but also lawsuits, frivolous lawsuits are being filed against anyone in the counterterrorism community who dare to write and speak publicly about terror front organizations within the United States. And I ended up being hired and working for two and a half years as in-house counsel for Daniel Pipe's Middle East Forum. And he really taught me everything I knew about Islamism as a political and theological entity. And he established a legal defense fund where we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to protect those in the moderate Muslim and counterterrorism community who were sued for speaking out against the terror front organizations they were exposing by the terror front organizations they were exposing in an effort to silence and intimidate them. And during my work there, I researched and I learned there were millions and millions of dollars going towards a strategic legal attack not just against Americans and our free speech, but also against the United States and against Israel in an effort to undermine the ability of these democracies to fight and defeat terrorism on the asymmetric battlefield. So beyond, besides the United States, Israel obviously has been the number one target for what we call this lawfare attack, lawfare. Like warfare, but lawfare the use of the law as a weapon of war to undermine democracies. For example, the war crimes charges that were filed against Israeli officials in Belgium, in Switzerland, in Canada, all over the world, to the point where C.P. Levy and Ariel Sharon couldn't land in London without fear of an arrest warrant. But Hamas and Hezbollah, sorry, the political wings of Hamas and Hezbollah, we're free to cross European borders with impunity. That's not justice, that's not due process, that's strategic lawfare. When the International Court of Justice released its advisory opinion declaring that Israel's security barrier, brick and mortar and concrete, is a violation of international law, those judges refused to enter into evidence the very relevant fact that the fence contributes to a sharp decline in the loss of human lives. They refuse to hear evidence from Christian, Muslim, and Jewish victims of terrorism. And yet, they decided to release an advisory, non-binding advisory opinion, okay, that Israel's security fence is a violation of international law. That's not due process, that's not justice. That's the perversion of a legal system to undermine a democracy as they fight terrorism. Of course, there's the total redefinition of the word state in international law by the UN General Assembly by declaring that there is a state of Palestine when it meets none of the criteria of the legal definition. You can look it up in the Black's Law De uh, Dictionary. There is no defined border. The Palestinian Muslims themselves will say that all of Israel is Palestine. There is no defined population. If you're calling for a rate of return for 90% of the Muslims that live in that area, who then is the citizenry of a so-called Palestinian state? And of course, there's no uh, legitimate, internationally recognized government. There's the Palestinian Authority, there's Fatah, there's Hamas, there's various other factions. And they were all created, by the way, the Palestinian Authority was created by virtue of the Al-Islam Accords, a bilateral treaty, which is now being violated. So it does not meet the definition of a state. And yet the reason why the legal definition of a state was perverted was so that the Palestinian entity can claim parity in international law and use courts like the International Criminal Court and challenge Israel by claiming that they are a state deserve it of being signatories to the Rome Statute and therefore can avail themselves of the jurisdiction of the court. And that is exactly what's happening now. I'm sure a lot of you are following the international lawfare threat against Israel at the International Criminal Court. Now, what the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is trying to do right now is something completely unprecedented. They are trying on two fronts, both against the United States and against Israel to exert jurisdiction 
over the military personnel of non-state parties to the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute is the document that gives the court jurisdiction. Customary international law states, and it's been this way since the beginning of the invention of international law, that states have a sovereign right to control their territory and control their people. International courts are given the authority voluntarily by states who acquiesce by signing a treaty, saying, okay, we acquiesce to your jurisdiction over our citizenry. And the Rome Statute is that treaty for the ICC. The majority of countries in the world have signed the Rome Statute. The United States has not, and neither has Israel, and for good reason. It is a politicized court that, again, is designed merely to attack the United States and Israel and undermine their sovereign right to self-defense. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. The ICC prosecutor has is attempting now to bring a case against Israeli so-called settlers operating in the West Bank, claiming that Palestine is a state and has become a signatory to the Rome Statute. Therefore, it has authority to exercise jurisdiction over Israeli civilians. That is outrageous, outrageous violation of customary law. And at the same time, the ICC is trying to do the same thing against the United States by claiming it has authority to investigate the actions of US military personnel in Afghanistan. So the Lawfare Project uh, was founded in 2010 because I saw this threat that's happening. And when I uh, finished working with Daniel Pipes, I ended up writing a book called Lawfare, War Against Free Speech. I said, you know, I really want to work for the pro-Israel ACLU. We have so many lawyers, we're such a philanthropic community. Where is the litigation fund that's designed to defend Israel? Where's the litigation fund that's designed to provide pro bono legal services to Jewish kids who are literally getting beaten up on campus right now? Where is the pro-Israel ACLU? And it turns out there wasn't one. And I couldn't believe it. This was a function that at some time in the past, the ADL kind of dabbled in. And if you think about it, okay, the health of a democracy is determined by how we can make change through nonviolence. Every four years, power you know, passes in the, in the executive peacefully. This is a miracle of, of, of political organization, okay? And we should be thankful that we live in this democracy. Also, all of the rights that we enjoy are products of seminal civil rights cases. Think about it, Roe v. Wade, okay? Women's right to choose. Brown v. Board of Education desegregation schools. These things would have never happened. They would have never been read into the Constitution or been part of our civil rights law if it wasn't for activist lawyers. This is a proud tradition we should be proud of. And Jews and Jewish lawyers who practically invented intersectionality have always been at the forefront of the civil rights movement for other minorities. We've been out front litigating for civil rights of other minorities. There's been Jews for LGBTQT, Jews for you know the Black Lives Matter, but where's the Jews for Jews? Where's the Jewish civil rights movement? So I decided when, when I found this out, I ended up uh, getting a meeting with Malcolm Holbein at the Conference of Presidents, and he encouraged me to set up this litigation fund. And since 2010. We have recruited over 400 lawyers internationally, 37 different law firms, and we have filed over 81 legal actions in 17 jurisdictions, all for under $2 million. And the reason why we've been able to do that is because we've tapped into a previously untapped resource, which is the pro bono commitments of major law firms and also individual lawyers. Most states, I don't think California, but New York for sure, there's a minimum hour pro bono commitment. And law firms love to do this because it makes them look good and it brings a lot of publicity to the firm. So we become very attractive clients. Number one, we're bringing groundbreaking cases. And number two, mostly 
when an indigent uh, uh, plaintiff comes to a firm, not only does the firm have to donate their lawyer's time pro bono, but they also have to pay out of pocket for litigation expenses, deposition, filing fees, ex expert witnesses, travel, hotel costs, you know, report, court reporter costs, you name it. I fundraise to support those costs. So not only do I come to the firm and say, all you need to do, and, and if you can't do pro bono, we also take reduced rate, is donate your time. And I will fundraise not only to support the cost of your lawsuit, but I come with two major PR firms, one based in DC, and we work actually with a couple in Europe, and we bring tremendous positive press to the law firms, and they've been taking on our cases. So one, I'll go into uh, a couple of the cases. So first of all, when we heard about what was happening at the ICC, at the International Criminal Court, we hired lawyers from the law firm of Nine Bedford Row. We were admitted to the court and we were able to submit amicus briefs and we were allowed to argue before the court in the Afghanistan case. And we strategically picked that case because the precedent that we set there will no doubt be used when it comes to judging the uh, statehood and territory issue against Israel. And what we argued for the first time ever was that the Rome Statute itself, which authorizes the International Criminal Court or attempts to authorize them to exert jurisdiction over non-state parties, is not only a violation of customary international law, but it's also a violation of the principle of complementarity, which is also written into the statute that says the court cannot take a case if the jurisdiction from which the accused comes from has a competent judicial system. Now I'm telling you, the United States judicial system has its problems, but it's the best in the world. And there's no one that can argue that the United States does not try its own citizens for violations of the laws of armed conflict. We have military courts. We put our own personnel on trial for torture that you know, allegedly happened in Guantanamo and so forth. So our arguments were successful. The uh, pre-trial chamber ruled against <coughs> exerting jurisdiction over US mili military personnel, but the prosecutor has appealed. And now we're arguing at the appellate uh, court, and no one else engaged in this, which was mind-boggling to me that, that we had to send lawyers to do this. I, I didn't understand why nobody was engaging. Um, and we're expecting a decision in the next three months. But what's so positive about this is that the ICC's attempt to bring jurisdiction has brought out Hungary, Australia, Canada, and of course the United States under the Trump administration that has declared loud and clear that if the ICC attempts to exert jurisdiction over US military personnel or Israeli personnel, they're gonna seek not only visa restrictions, but criminal charges against ICC personnel. And if any US or Israeli persons are detained, that they will declare a military conflict with that state and <laughs> the war crimes charges that I mentioned before. It was you know, mind-boggling to me, how is it that the Palestinians and their sympathizers were able to hire lawyers in Belgium and Switzerland and Canada and all those countries that I mentioned before, file war crimes charges against Israelis, and not one lawyer had been hired to do the same for us. So we found out that Leila Khaled, who is the first female Palestinian Muslim hijacker, she is a uh, PFLP darling, a, the, the Palestinian, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a designated foreign terrorist group, was traveling to Europe about two years ago. She was giving a speech, um, first in Spain, and then she was scheduled to travel to Italy. We sent our, no, I mentioned I had 400 lawyers. I have a lawyer in almost every single Western jurisdiction. We sent our lawyer in Spain to her speech. We recorded it. We picked up the pamphlets where they were fundraising illegally for PFLP. Over, we overnighted that to our attorneys in Italy who literally within 12, stayed up all night 
translated the materials into Italian, gave it to the Italian uh, counterterrorism unit, and when Leila Khaled was traveling two days later via train from Spain to Italy, she was stopped at the border, she was denied entry into Spain, and she was sent back to Jordan. Yeah. We then applied for an Interpol arrest warrant, which is a European-wide arrest warrant, and we have now sued and are, are engaged in criminal proceedings in Spain against those Spanish people who facilitated her event and who were fundraising for her. And there's also a subpoena out uh, for arrest of Leila Khaled in, in Spain. Then we're gonna go through the we'll do rapid fire cases, okay? <laughs> and then we can open it up for a question. Now, about, I think it was about three, a little bit over three years ago, the European Trade Commission attempted to ban the import of Israeli products that were connected to the so-called disputed territories. We were retained by a European shopping mart called Casamax, which is like a, a glorified version of, of Shop and Stop, Stop and Shop, but I'm sure you've, you've seen it if you've traveled. A portion of Casamax, uh, sells alcohol, and, and a section of the alcohol is uh, kosher wine, and a section of that is kosher wine from the Golan. And so we brought an action on behalf of Kazamax, arguing that as an EU trader, has nothing to do with Israel, we didn't debate Israeli foreign policy or Israeli politics or the right of Israel to engage in disputed territories, but as an EU trader, his commercial rights were being violated because the European Trade Commission was attempting to ban a product, which they could not do legally without proving that there's an issue with the mercantility of the project, the, the product. They had to prove that there was something wrong with the wine in order to ban it. And the European Trade Commission's argument was, well, we need certification authority. We need certification from a state authority that the product is coming from an area where that government is able to certify that there's nothing wrong with the product. And because we don't recognize Israel's sovereign authority in the disputed territories, there's nobody to give certification. So we can't allow it in. It has nothing to do with attempting to ban the product. We said, no, that's a de facto ban. And we chose wine from the Golan, who said, okay, don't recognize Israel's sovereignty. Who are you gonna recognize? Syria? There's no one else, you have no uh, uh, other options. You have to recognize Israel's sovereign authority, otherwise you're de facto banning my product. That's a violation of EU trade laws, a violation of the WTO provisions. And we won the argument. And we won the argument so much so that the client and our attorneys were invited to hearings at the European Parliament where their testimony and their arguments were then adopted as law as European antitrust policy, and now, if you are caught colluding with another party in an attempt to ban products from Israel or other disputed territories, you can be fined up to 10% of your prior year income. Because we had that win, the European Commission turned around and said, okay, we're not gonna ban you, we're gonna label you instead. So the European Trade Commission then issued a regulation saying that products coming from Israeli disputed territories should be labeled coming from an illegal Israeli colony. And that was then adopted by France. So we ended up suing the French government at the Conseil d'Etat, which is the highest administrative court in France on behalf of Sago Winery, which is an incredible award-winning winery um, I highly recommend it. We literally get paid in cases of wine for our work. Um, they're incredible clients. And we sued French, uh, the French on government on behalf of Sago Winery, arguing that EU law does not require this labeling because there is no uh, law. It's just a trade commission that authorized this. It ended up being heard before the uh, European Court of Justice, which is the Supreme Court of Europe, and we ended up losing the case. This was about a month ago. 
But the irony is we won by losing. Because what happened? Prior to us bringing the case, there was the European Trade Commission and French regulation saying it is mandatory to label the product as an illegal Israeli colony. And we said, no, 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 there's no EU law saying that. We brought it up to the European Court of Justice. And we asked, is it mandatory to label Israeli products coming from disputed territories? They said, yes, it's mandatory. But you only have to label it so that the consumer can differentiate that it wasn't produced by a Palestinian, i.e., you have to differentiate between products produced by Jews and Muslims living in the same territory. That was the ruling. It was so discriminatory on its face, but it got rid of the Israeli colony requirement. So I can literally write on the line, produced by a proud Israeli Jew. <laughs> and so what we did is, one of the great parts of my job is you can also delve into graphic design and, and arts and stuff. So we helped design this new label. Um, actually, let me, let me tell you one thing before that. When the ruling came out, it was so outrageous. And they couldn't even justify the, that they're doing this because of Israel. So the way the court justified it is they said, well, consumers have a right to know not only if something comes from a disputed territory, but whether it's a democracy, whether there's human rights violations happening. So now this is the new rule, and of course it doesn't justify to Israel. So they've opened up a Pandora's box now, and we incorporated a consumer protection association in France that has brought a case arguing that products from the United States have to indicate whether the producer is a Trump supporter or not. I have to know, because I, I, I would have to boycott it. You know, uh, we took shrimp from French Polynesia, has to be labeled oil from Russia, and Iran has to be labeled. So they have opened this Pandora's box because they couldn't on its face issue a discriminatory ruling. And because we were given now this wiggle room, we designed a label thanking uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, who came out right after the decision, and because of the decision, reversed American policy and said loud and clear that Jews are not illegal in their homeland. We did it. Did What's incredible to me was the, the reaction of the Jewish community, which I'm telling you, I cried, because the head of the reform movement released a statement agreeing with the European court, saying they should be labeled, and that's what got me. Because I spent two years fighting our enemies, and then I get stabbed in the back by our own. And APAC came out with a statement saying, we're not taking a position. If, if you don't take a position on the Jewish presence in its homeland, what do you stand for? So we designed a label, and I can show everyone if they want after it's on my phone, a new bottle of Sagot called Pompeo. Yeah. <laughs> with a hashtag that says made in legality. And so 5% of the proceeds of all the wine are being donated to the law fair practices. So I encourage you to drink your drink. Now, I also want to mention just yesterday that Lee Zeldin, Congressman Lee Zeldin, who is a hero of truth and of the Jewish people, just introduced a bill um, that uh, in the House that expands the Export Administration Act, which is the original anti-boycott bill under President Jimmy Carter. The bill says that it is illegal to collude with a foreign government to boycott Israel. Lee Zeldin just introduced a, a expansion of the bill saying not only should it be illegal to collude with a foreign government, but any foreign entity. It doesn't have to be a government. So if you cooperate with the European Court of Justice opinion, you can be held uh, criminally accountable and fined in the United wow. States, which is Lee Zeldin's proposal, and I recommend that we all support him for this initiative. And it also applies, by the way, to the UN blacklist, which they're saying is about to come out. But if you cooperate with any UN blacklist to boycott Israel, there could be accountability under US law. And I think it's very important the Jewish community shows support for this bill. It is absolutely crucial.
I want to dovetail a little bit into what's happening in terms of the rise of, of violent assaults and hate crimes against Jews. Um, first of all, I hate to, to be the bearer of not just bad news, but you know, terrible predictions. But what I'm seeing happening in Europe, especially in France right now, um, is I don't think in my lifetime I would have ever seen this. I'm literally having the conversations with my husband Matt at, at our dinner table that I remember my grandma telling me she overheard her parents having before World War II. The murder of Sarah Halimi in France Look, we've all come to expect the Islamist assaults and the attacks and the violence, but for a, for a prosecutor to refuse to bring the case, not even to put it before a jury and allow the defendant to argue the affirmative defense of mental illness, which he would be entitled to do and let a jury decide, but for a prosecutor to refuse to bring the case this, if you're not familiar, this is a Holocaust survivor who was brutally beaten, who was thrown out of the window to her death while anti-Semitic and Islamist epithets are being shouted at her. The murderer, because he smoked pot, the prosecutor said he could not have been in a proper mental state and I won't prosecute him. It has been called by the chief rabbi of France a license to kill Jews. And when you have the level of incitement going on in Europe that we're seeing, plus a failure of a judicial system to prosecute and uphold the rule of law, that is a recipe for disaster. And so we must do everything we can to make sure that the rule of law, the criminal code is upheld here in the United States. And we've seen attacks in Poway, we've seen Pittsburgh, in Brooklyn, where I live, with my family and my young children. Every day during Hanukkah, I opened up my phone and read a horror story. And the DA's office was not bringing hate crimes charges, and they were not making the effort to go after these people and put in the surveillance cameras and put in the surveillance and the boots on the ground. So we announced a partnership with the Spodic Law Firm and the criminal attorney, you might see him on Fox and MSNBC, Ken Belkin, he's, he's incredible, to provide pro bono legal services to anyone who has been a victim of an anti-Semitic assault. And our recent client is Lihi Aharon, who I'm sure you've read about, was attacked on the New York subway system by a black woman screaming at her. This, she is a curvy model. She makes a living, she actually lives here in LA. She's an Israeli model, she makes a living from her appearance. She was so viciously attacked, she scratched her face and left a scar from her eye to her cheek, on her face. We were retained, we brought it to the DA's office. Ken said to me, I have never seen such abuse of process. Not only were they rude to her, accused her of wanting publicity for filing charges, literally said, I feel like you're here because you want publicity, which is what they said to her. But they did not file, they did not uh, uh, file hate crimes charges. So we raised hell, we went to the media, it was a huge thing, you know, if you've read about it, that, that's great, we did our job, and within 24 hours, the district attorney reversed its opinion and indicted on hate crime charges and sent it to the grand jury. And that's the type of person that we need to set. <laughs> we have to send the message, and Matt always says, Jews don't riot, okay? You have two black people are refused a bathroom in Starbucks because they're not customers. I'm pregnant and I've been refused bathrooms because I'm not a customer. This is front page news. This is CNN for a week. This is Al Sharpton and this is everybody on TV. And there's a string of attacks and total, and almost total media silence unless you're reading the Algemeiner, you know, the Jewish Week or, or J-Post. You're not hearing about this on CNN and MSNBC. 
We have to force them to cover this. And that's what we did. Now I want to turn also just to, I'm going to do BDS, then I'm going to do campus, and then we're, we can open it up for discussion. So the, everyone talks about BDS, BDS, okay? It's an acronym, I guarantee you go out, I, I normally say Broadway, I'm gonna say Sunset Boulevard, and you know, poll 100 people and say what's BDS? Maybe three people, all three people from here will know what the acronym stands for. We have to stop using the term. What is being advocated is illegal commercial discrimination against people because of their minority status. Now, the so-called boycott movement started in the 70s, and I mentioned before Carter's uh, uh, Expert Administration Act. It started with the Arab League, okay? It was a foreign government funded and organized thing. Now, that has morphed into what seems to be this grassroots movement that's so well organized with glossy pamphlets and holding you know, multi-million dollar conferences every year at every campus, but is really being organized by BNC, the Boycott National Committee, which has on its board for everybody to see Hamas and Hezbollah, foreign designated terrorist groups, and American Muslims for Palestine, which is also deeply connected to a lot of nefarious entities. And they're the trickling down and controlling what's happening on campus. It is not a grassroots student-led movement. It is exactly the opposite. And what they are advocating for is com illegal commercial discrimination. That's what we have to call it, illegal commercial discrimination. Just like you can't have a store and put a sign out saying no blacks allowed, or I can't operate a bar and say no Chinese allowed, I cannot have a business and say, I'm not selling to you because you're gay. I cannot have a business that says, I am not doing business with you because you're Israeli. Every state, almost every state, maybe two, two don't. California has a great anti-discrimination law. New York has an excellent anti-discrimination law. It's UNRWA here, I, I believe. It is illegal in the commercial context to discriminate against someone in the employment context because of their race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and national origin. And what the so-called BDS movement does is advocate for unlawful discrimination based on national origin, based on where you're from. And so this is, you know, to us, a perfect anti-discrimination case. And the mistake that we keep making, and this is also what we saw with, with SFSU, is that instead of talking about it in a civil rights advocacy context, we are a minority community. We are the oldest minority community, the most persecuted minority community in the world. And instead of using a type of progressive language, we're saying, you know, we're debating the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we are falling into the trap because the conflict happening thousands of miles away is what's being used to engage in unlawful discrimination against someone because of a protected category. So the National Lawyers Guild, which is the oldest lawyers guild in America, a nonprofit organization, passed a resolution, a so-called BDS resolution, saying that we encourage our members not to engage in any type of commercial behavior with Israelis. My client, incorporated a company called Bibliotechnical in Israel. They attempted to buy an ad in the annual gala dinner journal at the National Lawyers Guild. They paid $200, the ad said, I don't know, something like, congratulations, National Lawyers Guild, you're doing a great job, love, Bibliotechnical, comma, Gush Etzion, comma, Israel. To which NLG was stupid enough to reply in an email, in writing, Here's your money back, I'm sorry, we don't do business with Israelis. So we sued the National Lawyers Guild in the first ever so-called anti-BDS case in New York State. We passed two motions to dismiss, which already in and of itself set a legal precedent. And now we are engaged in litigation against NLG, and we will win. And we will set a legal precedent that BDS is illegal in New York State, and we will do the same thing whenever a client comes to us and says that they've been discriminated against. 
Now, another uh, entity that we've gone after is Kuwait Airways. Um, has anyone heard about what's happening with Kuwait Airways? So these are, that's our case. So Kuwait Airways Corporation is the arm of the Kuwaiti government, the airline arm of the Kuwaiti government. They used to fly out of JFK to Heathrow and back and all had all these inter-European flight paths. We brought legal actions against Kuwait Airways because they refused to carry Israeli passengers. We brought actions against them in the United States, in Switzerland, in France, and in Germany. And a lot of those still actions are pending but we managed to shut down over half of all Kuwait Airways flight paths. We shut down their JFK London route. We shut down all of their inter-European flight paths because they would rather lose millions and millions of dollars than allow Israelis to touch their dirty carpets on their old disgusting planes. That's how, that's how deep their animus is. And so now we're going after their connecting flights through Kuwait to third party destinations because we sent someone to the airport and we proved that you don't have to go through customs because they have in Kuwait, like what we have here at LAX and JFK, connecting flights this way. You do not have to go through customs. So they do, cannot avail themselves of the excuse that as a sovereign entity, we can choose who comes within and without our borders because they have chosen to set up under federal aviation treaties a no custom zone. So they should not be able to, to make that defense. And so we're aiming to either shut down the rest of their flights for discrimination or break the Arab League boycott. What's so hard? Just fly an Israeli. Emirates airline does it. You know, other airlines do it. It's enough. It's the 20th century. I mean, get over it. But they refuse. <laughs> So finally, moving to the last part, and I want to talk about campus. Okay, one of the uh, services that Lawfare Project provides is pro bono counsel and support to dozens and dozens of students as they, you know, go through, unfortunately, uh, the campus environment, which has become extraordinarily toxic. And what I want to emphasize, even though I've been speaking about litigation, okay, Nine out of 10 cases that are brought to us are settled. We're able to work amicably with the administration. We're able to you know, remind uh, the, the parties what their legal obligations are. And only litigation is always a last resort. I would not want to waste my time and money in litigation, but when we have to, we do. And I think one of the most significant cases that we recently brought and actually ended up settling was the case, the civil rights case against San Francisco State University. Now, San Francisco State University was ground zero for the anti-Jewish campus movement. In the 70s, Yasser Arafat himself flew from uh, uh, Egypt at that time, okay, to San Francisco and established GUPS at SFSU, the General Union of Palestinian Students, which then became SJP. The Israeli Apartheid Week started at SFSU. The boycott, you know, student union votes, you know, started at SFSU. And they, it's the testing ground. And that movement is then exported elsewhere. Now, we sued San Francisco State University in federal court and in state court on behalf of students and on behalf of adult community members based on two uh, fact patterns. The first was the shutdown, the unlawful shutting down of then Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barakat's speech. Nir Barakat was invited by Hillel, the only Jewish student group on campus, to speak. Everybody was invited, everybody was to ask, you know, invited to ask questions, to engage in a civil dialogue. He was shouted down by an angry mob threatening violence to the point where the Jewish attendees, the speech was shut down, the Jewish attendees, the students, were escorted under police protection out of the room because they feared for their safety. This is America, okay? 21st century America. And what's so significant, what we found out, was that campus police were given a stand down order by the administration. So campus police were about to remove the protesters 
according to the student code. And the administrators that were present said, stand down, Let, let's see what happens. Wow. And the reason why that's so significant is because as all of you know, they are watching what we're doing. They're watching how the administration reacts and they're watching how the Jewish community acts. And everything is incrementally getting worse. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens in increments. And they were testing the limit. Can we threaten them with violence? Can we get up in their face? What can we do and how are the campus police gonna react? And guess who was whispering in their ear the whole time? Palestine Legal and National Lawyers Guild. Where literally there were representatives of, of lawyers there whispering in their ears and telling them how to walk that fine line. And if we had allowed this to stand without any type of reaction, we would have been sending them the green light to continue with their activities. So we sued the school for a First Amendment violation based on that state action, that stand down order. Now the second um, fact pattern was the Know Your Rights Fair. Every year, student groups are allowed to table um, at universities to advertise their group and to recruit other students. And almost every single student group tabled except Hillel was not allowed to table at the fair. Now, when we sued the school for discrimination against the Jewish student group, what's so interesting is that the defense was, you know, they admitted it was not a question of fact whether or not Hillel was denied the ability to table. They admitted, they said, yeah, yeah, we didn't allow Hillel to table, but we didn't, you know, not allow them because they're Jewish. We didn't allow them to table because they're Zionists. And Zionism is a political point of view. And under the California UNRWA anti-discrimination law, the categories protected are race, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, blah, blah, blah. Political viewpoint is not a protected category. So that's not a civil rights violation. And so our counter argument was, well, not only is Zionism an integral part of the Jewish identity, I mean, Israel as a homeland is, you know, undeniably part of our faith. We pray, you know, facing Israel. We say next year in Jerusalem and so on and so forth. But only Jews are given a political litmus test before they're allowed to participate. So let's say I acquiesce. Okay, it's a political point of view. Do you go to the Chinese student group and say, hey, you, What's your opinion on China's one, pol one child policy? Unless you agree with me, I'm not gonna allow you to the table. Or hey, you Iranian Muslim student group, what's your opinion on Iranian nuclear disarmament? Unless you agree with me, you're not allowed to table. Hey, you Jew, are you a Zionist? Are you pro-occupation or anti-occupation? Unless you're a good Jew, you're not allowed to table. And that in and of itself is discriminatory. That political litmus test and we're seeing that being used as an excuse for you know, the Women's March or the Progressive Marches, for example. Zionist Jews not allowed, they are not good Jews. The base, you don't even have to engage in a debate about what Zionism is, the civil rights movement of the oldest minority community and most persecuted minority in the world. The fact that you're turning to me and because of my ethnicity, because of my religion, because of my national identity, asking me, to answer your political question, giving me a political litmus test, that is racist in and of itself. I don't go to you and say, hey, you black, what do you think about Sudan? What do you think about so and so forth? It's so obvious on its face. And yet for some reason, when it comes to Jews, people aren't able to sniff out racism when it's so blatantly obvious. So we ended up getting the help of Winston and Strong that donated over $2 million of pro bono legal support to the case. We had 12 attorneys fly to San Francisco. Three of them were partners. And after day one of trial, SFSU turned around and said, okay, we're gonna settle. <laughs> and so we said to them, well, we're happy to settle, but we're gonna settle for more than what we would've gotten in a court of law. And not only did we get $200,000 to go to diversity training. We got a mural on campus, which was really important to the clients. They really wanted a mural, because when you walk into SFSU, there's a, a painting with every other you know, ethnic identity, and they also deny the Jews. 
Now when you walk in this will be a beautiful mural about Zionism in Israel. A ground zero. We outsource all of their anti-discrimination complaints. So now they have to spend probably six figures on a third party company. They're no longer able to adjudicate for at least the next two years their, their anti-discrimination complaints. But for the first time in American history, a state entity, the California State University System, which was the defendant in the case, which SFSU is a part of, CSU in our settlement agreement agreed that is now the official policy of the California State University System that quote, Zionism is an integral part of the Jewish identity, end quote. So you can no longer use the excuse that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. And finally, because um, I can see some of you are looking at your watches, um, we filed the first ever uh, OCR complaint, Office of Civil Rights complaint, after the Trump administration's executive order on Title VI. Now, what's so significant, the complaint was against Columbia University, and I actually have it here because I wanted to read a little part of it. Um, what's so interesting to me is how people in the Jewish community literally can't understand that protecting Jews as a minority community under civil rights law, just like you protect blacks, just like you protect Muslims, just like you protect gays, has nothing to do with violation of your First Amendment right to free speech. And all of the criticism of reading Judaism as a protected category, reading religion as a protected category under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, that it's a violation of free speech, to me, is so blatantly racist. Would you ever argue that I have a free speech right to discriminate against someone because they're black? I mean, the mental disconnect there, and just what Title VI does, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is it says that the federal government is no longer obligated and can withdraw federal funding from campuses that tolerate a hostile, a pervasively hostile environment for students based on these protected categories. Title VI does not have religion as a protected category. So what Trump did in executive order, and obviously we all wished it was a law, but with this politicized climate where you can't even pass a resolution that condemns anti-Semitism and only anti-Semitism but qualifying it with Islamophobomania, they are no, they're not going to you know, push it. And so what Trump's executive or pass it, what Trump's executive order did, they said, well, it is now the position of the US government, the Department of Education, the DOJ, which is under you know, the executive branch, that religion, and of course, Judaism is a religion, will be protected category under Title VI. And so we brought, uh, we filed the OCR complaint, and actually we had been working on it for months, um, and we delayed it just a couple days to be able to incorporate the new provisions of Title VI. Now again, what we're seeing is politics being used as an excuse to target an, a student because of their protected category, because they're Israeli or because they're Jewish. And so the criticism of Title VI is a violation of free speech. Would they say the same thing if I said, I have a problem with Russia. I don't like this foreign government. So I'm gonna turn around to you American with Russian heritage, I'm gonna shout at you, I'm gonna yell at you, I'm gonna pick on you in class because your parents are Russian. Or I don't like, again, Iran. Or I don't like Qatar. So I'm gonna turn around and blame you because you're Muslim for a foreign government. I'm gonna project my problems with a foreign government on you because of your religion and your national origin. And that's exactly what happened to Jonathan Carton. Jonathan is a Jewish Israeli. When he engaged with SJP, he was called a racist. He was told to go fuck himself. He was flipped off. He was called a Zionist pig, a Zion Nazi. Arabic happens to be his mother tongue. He was told, why don't you come up with your own culture? Stop stealing Arabic culture. One of the professors at Columbia University wow praised Is al-Din al-Qassam Brigades, which is the military wing of Hamas, the US designated foreign terrorist organization that killed his uncle. 
a professor went up to him, pointed at him while he was talking to other students, saying, don't talk to him, he's Mossad. And we filed this complaint. And yet members even of the Jewish community said, well, by filing this complaint, you're risking violating the free speech of, of campus. But this is not free speech. You can debate Israel-Palestine all you want. What you can't do is turn around and discriminate against Jews and Israelis because you have a problem with a foreign government. The last two, can I just say a couple other things that are really, okay. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize the power of arming our students with legal. Up to date, okay, the, the, the Jewish community, which is extraordinarily philanthropic, has taken the stance that the way to combat anti-Semitism on campus is to arm Jewish students with a defense of Israel. So we should tell, you know, teach Jewish students how to defend Israel. Israel is a democracy, Israel has great beaches, Israel has Arab MKs, Israel you know, can't be an apartheid state because of so on and so forth. Number one, you never win when you're on the defense. And number two, it is not the job of Jewish students to defend a foreign government. And what you, we need to do instead is whenever something happens to a Jewish student, provide them with legal counsel so they can argue that their, their protected status, their minority rights, their civil rights are being violated. For example, when a teacher at Boston University singled out Raphael Fills, one of our clients, because he was a Jew, because he was a proud Zionist and targeted him, we worked with Raphael Fills and the administration we, again, and very amicably reminded them what their obligations were. That teacher no longer works there, and Raphael was getting a pass grade when he was prior failed and denied testing accommodations. At Temple University, when our client Daniel Vassell went up to the SJP table and said, hey, my name is Daniel, let's engage. I'm, I'm an Israeli Jew, I'd love to talk to you. They responded by punching Daniel in the face and calling him a, a Zionist baby killer. We provided Daniel with three pro bono counsels, filed criminal charges. The assailant ended up having to issue a public apology, do hours of community service, uh, and there was never any violent incident on campus again. It's not about debating the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When Rutgers hosted U.S. to Gaza, Baca, and Code Pink on campus to do fundraising for the flotilla movement. The Jewish community was up in arms, but the Rutgers president said, free speech, free speech, we have to allow them on campus. We wrote a very friendly 35 page memo <laughs> telling him that if he releases a penny of those funds, not only will we ensure he spends 22 years in prison, but we will sue him for material support for terror violations because U.S. Takaz and Baca and Hamas were stupid enough to post online that they were working together. U.S. Takaz and Baca and Kopink, sorry, were stupid enough to post online that they were working together with Hamas to arrange docking for the flotilla, and Hamas is a designated terrorist group, and deliver materials to Hamas, which again is a violation of federal law. The president returned all of the funds and they were never invited back on campus. That is the power of using legal arguments. And what did it cost me to write that letter? Nothing. Nothing. Okay? So the last thing, and I promise this is the last thing that I want to talk about, is the root cause or one of the root causes of, of the problem. And that is the foreign funding that's going towards U.S. campuses. Now, there are several uh, U.S. entities that have accepted millions and millions of dollars from foreign governments, including Qatar. I'm sure you've heard of what happened with Duke and UNC. Now, I want to get this right, so I just want to pull up my notes, wherever they are. Here. So Duke and UNC have a partnership, okay, through their Consortium for Middle Eastern Studies, and the public school education system, where they were receiving money from Qatar, the second largest state sponsor of terrorism, to train K through 12 teachers who were given a grant to attend the conference and have to sign an agreement that they were going to use the curriculum provided by them to them by a foreign government 
in their classes. I'm talking about kindergarten right now, okay? Training programs for K through 12 educators. You have universities like Northwestern, for example, where the relationship between Northwestern and Qatar is shrouded in secrecy. Apparently there's a memo of understanding that we don't know about, but we do know there's a lot of money being exchanged and there's a campus for journalism in Qatar and Northwestern is one of dozens of schools that operate like this with a foreign government. Now besides the fact that we have laws, federal laws, that require the reporting of foreign government money coming to our education system, which are just now being enforced under the Trump administration, we also have FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which says that if you are operating as a foreign agent on behalf of a government, if you are receiving money or any type of strategic direction or control from a government, or if there's the appearance of strategic direction or control from a foreign government, you must register as a foreign agent under FARA. Or if you don't, it's illegal. You can go to jail. And so the administrators and these schools should be registering under FARA at the very least, and yet they're not. The federal law has to be enforced, and there has to be public outcry about this, because the curriculum is not just anti-Semitic. I mean, that's just like one-tenth of it. Look at what's happening on college campuses right now. It's anti-American, it's socialist, it's pro-communist, it's, it's radical. And this is because of the foreign funding of the ethnic studies departments in the schools of journalism and so forth. And so what we've done is all we can, we've been filing Freedom of Information Act requests and Public Record Act, Act, Record Act requests, trying to get information from these schools of what's going on. And when we file it with the Department of Education, we just got a response, I'm sorry, we don't have any records from this school. Well, if you don't have records from the school, you just admitted that they violated the federal law because they're obligated to file that they're receiving foreign funding. So either way, what's going on? And we have to demand accountability in, the re in this arena because this is the root cause of what's going on. And the educations of our 17, 18, 9 year olds right now is going to determine the political future of this country. And it's bigger than Israel, okay? So with that, we will open it up to discussion. But thank you. I think you really hit the nail on the head when you, you said your comment was deleted. And what we're seeing now are private companies, Twitter, Facebook, Target Jews, Wikipedia, Target pro-Israel group, delete their comments, Target conservatives, Target pro-Trump supporters, but allow terrorist groups, Twitter accounts, deleting Fox News hosts for retweeting the motives, exactly what you said. He didn't even put his own uh, Okay, Pete Hegseth, okay, was just banned from Twitter. He is a Fox News host for retweeting one of the murderers, I can't remember, motive, his own tweet without making any comment whatsoever. And so we need, and, and I feel like it, it started a little bit, to hold the internet companies accountable. It's very hard to do as a private citizen to bring an action in this country. In Europe, however, it's not. 
And one of the things we've done, for example, is we're working, uh, we, we ended up, we sued Google in Spain, or we filed a claim against Google in Spain. And we ended up settling with them as well because we argued it was a violation of European hate speech law to allow neo-Nazi and Nazi and Holocaust denial websites in Spain. And Google did not want to litigate it. And now we are in touch with in-house counsel for Google. And we're working together with the World Jewish Congress to take down websites from the internet and also to change the search algorithms. It's easier to do that in Europe than it is to do here. Because here, we have laws that protect, and I'm always bad at this, but it's like host providers or, or content host providers from liability. And actually, there was a test case filed by a little bit all over the place here, but by Nisa Light or Shira Hadin against Facebook, which is another incredible Israeli based lawyer who specializes in material support to hold Facebook accountable for allowing the postings of radical Islamists when they were calling for the knife intifada. And she ended up losing that case because we have robust laws that protect the internet providers from liability of the content that third parties post on them. And I think that aside from evaluating those laws and pushing our elected officials to reevaluate those laws, we also have to come up with creative ways to hold these companies accountable for discrimination without proving, for example, only discrimination based on religious status. So when, for example, they're deleting my tweet um, because I'm talking about radical Islam, it has nothing to do with me being a Jew, it's my political opinion, so it's not a First, you know, it's not a first Amendment violation, they're a private company, but they're engaging in practices that are treating other people differently because they have different points of view, there has to be some sort of accountability there. Because otherwise, if we're not free to engage in a dialogue on the internet about the very real threat that radical Islam poses, we're not going to be able to understand it. We're not going to be able to defeat it. One thing that I'd like to beg you is to not call the left bank or the bank. Judea and I agree with you. I slip up I sometimes. I don't want to ever hear that. I agree with you. Falling into their trap. You're right. To You're right. Right, so his argument is very interesting. So he's arguing my understanding, and if anyone's more familiar with the case, they don't pipe up right now, because I, I can make a mistake, because I, I haven't read the papers in over a year. But my understanding, and there is precedent for this, but in, in, not in the internet world, okay, but in the real world, that you have free speech rights in a public forum, even if it's privately owned. So let's say I go to Century City, which is a privately owned complex, but there's a part where the public gather, and then it's traditionally used to engage in free speech, to get on your soapbox. You can make, and there is Supreme Court precedent, that the argument that a private company, even though the Constitution protects you vis-a-vis -vis the government, is violating your free speech rights. Prager is saying, well, the internet is like you know, the cafeteria or, or that public forum, even though it's privately owned. And so he's coming up against exactly that federal law that protects internet companies and saying, no, 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 you can't, maybe you're immune from a lawsuit if somebody posts something because you can't possibly review the millions of posts on Google and be held responsible for them. But surely if Google acts, and does something intentionally to shut me down and treats me differently, I should have free speech protections on the internet. It is a groundbreaking argument. And like everything in this country, the law is whatever the judge says it is. So we have to wait and see what's gonna happen, but no doubt that's gonna set an incredibly important precedent either way. No, she wants to send the camera. Yeah. 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 But I'll tell you something. 
okay? Now, I, I had a lot of experience interviewing Palestinian parents. And what I found is that there are uh, two categories, okay? Number one, those three categories. Those that behave like that and believe it, those that behave like that out of threat of being accused of being a collaborator, which comes with the death penalty, and those that are brave enough not to behave like that. And when I interviewed, for example, Hussam Abdu's parents, Hussam Abdu was a 15-year-old physically handicapped Palestinian Muslim, and don't say Palestinian, say Palestinian Muslim, because guess what, I'm a Palestinian I'm Jew, I'm 25% Middle Eastern. And back before the State of Israel was established, you would have called me a Palestinian. Okay, so Palestinian Muslim. So when we interviewed Hussam Abdu's parents, they said to me on camera, which is why this interview was so significant, he became the, the main character of my film, that they don't support the use of children as suicide homicide bombers, and they cry to me on camera, which they risk their lives to speak to me on camera to say that against the Allah Aqsa modern kids that literally just tried to murder their child. And yet I went and I interviewed his sister, and she held up a beautiful plaque for me from Hamas in a Lucite frame, and she was very proud of her brother because he was, he was a dwarf, so he was marginalized, he was teased, he was a loser, and now she had a cool brother because he was a shaheed who was attempted suicide bomber and he was in prison for attempted murder. And so you'll see the generational gap. We still have parents who are against the murder of their children. Why? Because they're human. Okay, they don't want their kids to die. And yet, a generation later, the indoctrination is so severe that this sister doesn't care about her brother, wants her brother to die. And then when I interviewed Wafa Idris's mother, Wafa Idris was the first Palestinian female suicide bomber who blew herself up in a Jerusalem marketplace, killed one and injured a hundred other. The mother said to me, where's my money? She was getting payments from the Palestinian Authority every month, and apparently they didn't make the payment that month. And she was complaining that she wasn't getting her money. It turns out that Wafa Idris was divorced, she was barren, and she was accused of adultery by her cousin and her own brother, and she was threatened with an honor killing. And so she said, okay, I'll blow myself up, we'll get the payments, instead of being stoned publicly. So I just wanna say that every Suicide homicide bomber is another story. And we have to be very careful not to paint you know, a brush. It's all a very unique human experience, and that's one thing that I learned when I went and I sat and interviewed these families, that every story is different. If I could, I'm just gonna shift the campus for a minute. So first I wanna thank you for everything that you're doing in Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I want to. I really appreciate your kind words. I want to say one thing though. Nothing that I'm doing is original. 
I'm copying everything that's been done before us for other minority communities. The war crimes charged to be filed against Native Hawaiian, I just copied what they were doing. Okay? When, the, when I watch for inspiration, I watch Martin Luther King's speeches, and you substitute black for Jew, and this is, it's the exact same thing. They are so relevant, it's, it's astounding. But I'll tell you, this, that's why I do the speaking engagements. We've taken ads out on campus papers, we do everything we can, but between us and this room, one of the obstacles we face is the Jewish institutional reluctance to engage not only in aggressive civil rights litigation, but actually their active attempts to dissuade and sabotage actions being brought. Because when you have a student group on campus, I don't know, I'm not gonna name the name, but let's say there's a, there's a student house, Jewish house, let's call it, okay? And they're sending out letters saying, you know, we're engaged with the administration and we're engaged in behind closed door negotiations. And the student who's a member of that Jewish house comes to you and says, I need legal representation because I'm not being represented there. We, we're making them look bad, okay? And we're bringing in action and solving the problem that they've been trying to solve. And we have come out and have, you know, they have come out and actively dissuaded students from seeking counsel. And this is a philosophical, it's like this victim mentality. It's not out of malice. They're not doing it because they're bad people. They're doing it because it's not just the way they do things and it's not the way they've been doing things. We have this shut still, it's work, send letters behind closed doors, negotiate with the administration, I don't want to cause a stink, I have to be on campus for the next 15 years, I'm raising money from the community, they survive off the donations from the community, they don't want to be seen as aggressors. But the one thing I've learned in my career is that nobody will respect you unless you respect yourself. And look at how other minority communities behave, they demand the respect. And no one's going to enforce your civil rights if you don't enforce them. So I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I think the, the Martin Luther King analogy is fantastic. My son actually gave a speech where he had been encouraged. He's the only boy with a kippa at UC Berkeley. And wow. he gave a speech. No, he's, you know what? Kabdeh was a kashteo, and he walks around very proud. And they know who he is, and no one's going to touch. And um, he gave a speech at one point to a, the Jewish community in the Bay Area, and he said, you know, um, I've been encouraged to take my kippa off by many people in this community, and I'm not going to go to the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was his analogy. He really, you know, felt right. that that was... It you know, really is our time right, right now. It is our that. civil rights yeah. movement. Like, we think we've been in this country for so long, and we're successful and we're assimilated. But if you really think about it, other minority communities have had their civil rights movements and they've been successful. It's our time now for the Jewish pride movement, the Jewish civil rights movement. I have a question. How can the Blacks, when Rosa Parks wouldn't move to the back of the bus, there was a big difference on the bus. Mm -hmm. All the other Blacks were on her side. Mm -hmm. How in the world can you ever have a civil rights movement or anything for the Jewish people when most of the Jewish people hate themselves? This is a million dollars. this, but all I know, again, I can only speak from experience. When I first started this, I had a lot of pushback from the Jewish community. Now that we are successful and we are showing that we can be successful and make change, there has been, I think, a significant paradigm shift where you see other groups are now starting also to engage in civil rights litigation because they see it works and all I can do is, is lead by example. But there is a deep, deep problem of psychological guts that we have that is <laughs> above my pay grade. Above my pay grade. What I say is the young people. Can you make young people? 
that? You know, one of the issues that I had, for example, with the Women's Rights Watch and the Women's Rights Movement as a progressive movement is that Jews were marching behind Linda Sarsour, Tamika Mallory, and Coke Paint because they felt they didn't want to see the space and they wanted to belong. And I couldn't see any other minority community behaving like that. And I just wonder if all of the Jews were unified in a voice saying, we will not be a part of a movement that excludes us, maybe at the beginning we could have made some systemic change there. But because we were marching behind them anyway, it was a, a very weak position to start from. And now we have Code Pink joining. I mean, I don't know whoever's marching on Saturday, like, good for you, but at least there should be some sort of demand um, that the leadership that you march behind does not include rabid neo-Nazi anti-Semites. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for all you're doing for the Jewish community. It's not amazing. I just want to say when I was in college in 1995, I experienced anti-Semitism by my roommates who put up a Nazi swastika sign in my dorm room, 666, and hung um, animals, you know, by the by their neck on the the ceiling. I was scared for my life. I ran down to the RN. My son was scared for my life. What did the University of Florida do? They suspended her. She had to meet with the rabbi on campus to learn about Judaism. I got a five-page letter from her apologizing. She said she was you know, ignorant. She didn't know about Judaism. She never meant to hurt me. She you know, learned a lot. And so where, I mean, where were you then? I'm just saying, like, I've heard of other situations like this. I was at a Republican Jewish Coalition event, and a woman was there, like asking Lisa Zafferty, who spoke, if she could find an attorney for her son, who was like, I, I don't know, something was going on in his classroom. So help us, so, so help us spread. spread. This yeah. is what we're doing, so help yeah, us like, raise awareness. So uh, we'll take what, one more, and then I'm going to come down, I can stay as late, and we, we can engage as much as possible. So I'm sure he's probably all those uh, women and women. Yeah. Elisa? Elisa. First of all, thank you. Elisa's doing some good training on YouTube. Yeah, with Brandeis. Yeah, Brandeis is a wonderful, yeah, it's a wonderful organization. Yes, no, we speak We speak to their students. They invite us to speak to them, and I, and I have a lot of respect for her and Nat. And the whole Zivotofsky case, we called an amicus brief. Unfortunately, it, it didn't go the way we wanted it to go. Yeah, yeah, sure you, won. you know, when you said you lost, you right, won. right. After when you told me, you lost because you won. Why? Yeah. Because they see the solution that came out was this decision was purely in the hands of the president. Right, because it was a political question. And they didn't know at that time that. Right, so let's see him do something. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>